Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to chair this first keynote lecture at the fifth joint conference on expectation surveys organized by the Bank of Canada, the European Central Bank, and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. We are very honored that today's keynote will be given by Anna Maria Lusadi, who is a professor of finance at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and the director of the Initiative for Financial Decision Making. In her keynote, she will ask why central banks should care about financial literacy. And there is no one who would be better suited to talk about this subject. Anna Maria is one of those researchers whose name is inextricably linked to an entire research field, which is financial literacy. She played a pioneering role in developing this field and recently called it her life's work. Her measurement of financial literacy, also known as the big three, has become the standard way to measure financial literacy around the world. It is based on three simple questions, referring to interest rate compounding, nominal versus real values, and portfolio risk diversification. At the ECB, we use this well-established measure to assess consumers' financial literacy in our consumer expectations survey. Strikingly, many people are not able to answer these simple questions, even in countries with well-developed financial markets. Anna Maria has shown in her research that this widespread lack of financial literacy matters significantly for people's economic situation. It has an impact on how people save, how they invest, and how they manage their debt. Financial literacy varies significantly across demographic groups, with young people and women displaying particularly low levels of financial literacy. In her JPE paper of 2017, Anna Maria has demonstrated the economic relevance of financial literacy by pointing to the important distributional effects it may have. According to her analysis, 30 to 40 percent of retirement wealth inequality is accounted for by financial literacy. Anna Maria's work has contributed significantly to making policymakers aware that financial literacy matters greatly for public policy. At the informal ECOFIN meeting of finance ministers and central bankers last February, financial literacy was recognized as essential for delivering capital markets union. By now, many countries have started to implement national strategies for financial literacy. These include integrating financial education into high, sc high school curricula and introducing courses in personal finance at colleges and universities. Anna Maria herself chaired the Italian Financial Education Committee and relentlessly engages in improving financial education across the world, not least through her initiative for financial decision making. Here at the ECB, we are acutely aware that financial literacy matters for our task. It matters whether people understand the concept of inflation, the difference between price level and inflation, the distinction between real and nominal magnitudes, as well as the operationalization of our price stability objective. So, the topic of today's keynote is of utmost importance to us, and we are very curious to hear your insights. So I'm very happy to give you the floor, Anna Maria, and after the lecture, we will have some time for the Q&A. The floor is yours. Thank you so very much for this nice introduction. I really would have liked to be there today. Um, unfortunately, this is just the beginning of the academic year, 
and uh, we are not I'm not able um, to be uh, in Europe today, uh, but thank you so much for this kind invitation. This work and this presentation is joint work uh, with Dimitris Georgarakos uh, from the ECB, but we are only us are responsible for the finding uh, reported here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to continue the presentation and the uh, research and uh, some of the work that we have already presented together with Maria de Merzis at the ECOFIN meeting in Ghent last February. And for some of you who, is, uh, who are interested in following some of this work, I would like to refer to the policy brief that we wrote, uh, documenting and showing the state of financial knowledge in the European Union. But what I would like to do today is um, talk a little bit more about some of the new findings uh, using, for example, other data, and in particular the data collected by the ECB, which in my view has been one of the most uh, interesting and, and rich source of information as we look at how people make financial decisions. So today I'm going to talk a lot about measurement and data. This has been um, how, where a lot of my work and concentrated, but in particular, I'd like to understand and show a little bit more how financial literacy is linked to financial decision making, in particular in the type of decisions that are important for the well-being of individuals, but can have also implication for policies that are linked to the financial stability of the system, that are linked to the transmissions of monetary policies, um, that are also linked to how can we communicate to the public. So I'd like to spend a little a bit of time in my presentation to talk about the implication of our finding for policy and programs, because I think there are indeed important implications. Um, I'd like to address uh, right at the start why central bank should care about financial literacy. And it's mostly because financial literacy is linked to the type of behavior that is very important for the policy of the central banks. And I'm talking about savings, I'm talking about debt management, financial fragility of households, and therefore also of the financial system, and also to the communication, the effectiveness of communications of central banks. And I'm going to take a somewhat different approach here than, for example, macroeconomists uh, or also applied economists are taking. I am taking a much more um, uh, data approach, uh, looking at different sources of data. But in particular, I'm going to take what I call a personal finance approach. In other words, I'm asking the question, do people have the knowledge? Um, of the fundamental concepts and very basic concepts at the basis of financial decision making? And are they able to use it? Um, do, for example, do they search? Uh, do they uh, compare terms when they engage in financial decision making? Um, and in which way are these behavior conducive to financial resilience and well being? Um, and in terms of central bank policies, in which way are these behavior, for example, affecting the macro economy? Uh, going back to um, the, the questions and going back to some of the behavior that can be very important, I'm going to focus indeed on, for example, saving and investing. I'm going to uh, look at how people, for example, choose their um, debt uh, products and also whether they are able to um, ensure against shock or preparing for the uh, shock that we are all affected by. I'm not meaning uh, macro shock or the shutdown of the economy, but do people make provisions, for example, for unexpected expenses? If a large group of the population doesn't, then there are implications also uh, for the macro economy. Um, I am going to um, show it again, um, the, the big three, and the reason why I'd like to um, show these questions is because, first of all, this question include a question about the knowledge of inflation, and of course this is uh, of critical import importance for the work of central banks, 
But in particular, I want you, and that's why I'm going to leave this question um, on the screen just for a few minutes to show just how simple um, the questions are when we are trying to measure financial literacy. So in other words, if you look at the ABC uh, of financial literacy, if you look at whether people know these very basic concepts that are at the basis of most financial decision making, we find that even in countries with well-developed financial markets, many people don't have this knowledge. And this, of course, raises important questions. And these are the questions I'd like to discuss today. If people cannot do a 2% calculation, if they don't know about inflation, if they don't know about the basics of risk diversification, how are they going to make decisions about saving, investing, and managing that? And rather than looking at the wealth uh, levels or the debt levels, I'm going to try to look at how this type of knowledge filter and goes through the financial decision making that people are doing with this type of very basic knowledge or rather ra lacking this very basic knowledge. Unfortunately, when we look at the data, and the recent issue of the new Journal of Financial Literacy and Wellbeing that has uh, uh, commissioned these studies looking at evidence from the US, but also Germany, Canada, um, Italy and Finland in, uh, in Europe, but also Eastern uh, Europe, Asia and Latin America, shows that we see very low level of financial literacy in most countries around the world. And interestingly and strikingly, we find very similar um, findings across these countries when it comes to financial literacy. I'm only going to mention one finding here, which is how low the level of financial literacy is, even when measured looking at the ABC of personal finance. And I welcome you, encourage you to read some of this special issue to see, for example, how much people know about inflation. And I want to report already that in Europe, and this I'm referring to the data um, that the European Commission um, has collected in the European Union countries, in Europe, even in a time of higher inflation in 2023, we see that a good one third of Europeans actually do not know about inflation, even though they are living in a moment where inflation is much higher than in the past. Now, I'm also what like to show now a little more about data and, and try to also improve upon these measures. Uh, clearly, if we look, for example, at a much um, broader measure of financial literacy as we have been uh, collecting since 2016, and in particular looking at personal finance knowledge, so the concepts that are at the basis of a lot of the personal finance decisions, so going well beyond the big three, but looking at the, at the eight topics, for example, that are part of a, um, of a personal finance course, by the way, but also that cover the many decisions that individuals are making, we see that even when looking at this much more sophisticated measure of financial literacy in the country uh, like the US with the most developed financial markets. First of all, we see a relatively low level of financial literacy. Um, not even uh, half of the question have been able to be answered correctly. Um, and so this is a failing grade when it comes to this personal finance knowledge. Yet again, this is basic knowledge. And what you can see that over time, we don't see any improvement, if any, the group of the population which has the lowest level of financial literacy seem to be getting bigger. And when we look at what are the topics that people know the least, unfortunately, and confirming, by the way, the findings already present in the big three, the topics that people know the least are the ones that might, that could be most important for when it comes to financial stability, when it comes to investing in the financial market, when it comes to being prepared for shocks. 
because what people know the least are disproportionately investing, insuring, and comprehending risk. And many other surveys around the world have confirmed these findings. And not just financial literacy is low, but this particularly severe among the young. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, as researcher and as academic, potentially we could do something about because the group of people um, in, uh, that I show here are also our students. But what this data also shows is that it's not that if people make a lot of financial decision, they acquire a lot of knowledge. As you can see here, even people after retirement don't seem to answer a very large number of questions. So in other words, people are often making decisions with low level of financial literacy, and this persists potentially across the life cycle. I also want to show a striking finding from the data, which is the gender difference in financial literacy. And what I report here is actually a finding which is constant and true across most of the countries around the world. And the reason I want to highlight this finding is because women are not a small group of the population. They are a large group of the population. So by addressing potentially gender differences, we can address financial literacy in a large group of the population, something I want to come back to toward the end. So it's not just financial literacy is low, but that this knowledge matters it matters for financial decision making, which is why it is relevant as well for policy and for programs. It matters, and in many studies we have shown it is linked to planning for retirement, and this is also true in the data, in the personal finance data I've shown here. In people who are more financially literate are more likely to plan and also to save for retirement. They are less likely to be that constrained and they are better able to deal with shocks. And this is, again, um, the, the behavior I would like to highlight because they can be linked indeed to policy. Uh, if a large enough group of the population doesn't save for retirement, doesn't participate in the financial markets, as problem managing that, there are implications for the uh, economy. And in particular, if people don't make provision, even for the short term, there can be, of course, problems if you know, the economy shuts down, if we are hit by a pandemic. And I want to concentrate in a moment precisely on this financial fragility. But I want you to say that when we look at this personal finance data, we have confirmed the findings that we have reported in many other studies. Um, and let me turn to one of these studies that we did. In 2008, 2009, I was visiting Harvard Business School, and together with Peter Tufano, we designed this question trying to measure uh, financial fragility, in other words, the capacity of people to deal with shocks. And the way we phrase the question is we didn't look at whether people had, for example, liquid wealth, but their capacity, their confidence of coming up with resources to face a mid-sized shock. And this is why we use this uh, value of $2,000. It's not really the value per se that matters, but we were trying to identify mid-sized shocks. And what you can see in this graph, and the reason I wanted to show the behavior over time, is how much the financial crisis had affected in 2008, had affected the financial fragility of Americans. Um, half of Americans would not have been able to face a small size shock um, after the, uh, the, the financial crisis. And what I think is also important to know that as the economy is getting better, so 10 years after the financial crisis, look at 2018, when the economy was doing a lot better 10 years without, in a sense, other crises, still one third of the population would not have been able to come up with $2,000, would not have been able to face a shock uh, even in a month time. And in January 2020, this is when we collect the data, each January before the pandemic hit, and when the stock market was at an all-time high in the US, 
and unemployment was at an all-time low, um, 26% of Americans would not have been able to face a mid-size shock. Unfortunately, they were going to, feel, to face a very dramatic shutdown of the economy. And as you can imagine, that required very quickly and swift intervention uh, by, the, by the government. I'm not saying that people should be able to face a macro shocks, but the fact that they are not also able to face a small uh, mid-size shocks, of course, makes the economy fragile and makes the financial well-being of individual, of course, uh, as well, less likely to, uh, to be jeopardized. So does financial literacy matter? Uh, it does matter, and even if we account for a lot of other financial circumstances, another reason why people might uh, not be able to come up with resources, we see an important aspect of financial literacy. And even if we look at more exogenous indicator of financial literacy than financial literacy per se, for example, being exposed to financial education, uh, we see that that knowledge matters for the financial resilience, for being able to cope with shocks. Here I'm reporting very simple estimation. These are a result also documented in a recent publication in the Journal of Accounting and Public Policy. But if you look at other estimation methods, for example, instrumental variable estimation, the suggestions, and this is important for the result I'm going to show you in a moment, is that perhaps these estimates are even an underestimate of the effect of financial literacy on behavior. So, you know, when we look at some of the estimates, they might actually be biased downward. If we look at this data from another angle, um, so let's look across countries. We have 27 data points in the flash Eurobarometer data. Do we see, you know, even at this very simple level, that the countries that have higher financial knowledge also do have, do they have lower financial fragility? And what that's also what we show in the micro data. And similarly, are the countries with higher financial literacy also having people that are more financially secure in the long term? For example, they have sufficient pension provision, they are confident in having sufficient retirement savings, and we see this in the macro data as well. But let me turn to what I think is one of, in my view, one of the most informative, really, uh, data set, and I want to praise the uh, European Central Bank for having collected such a rich source of information. We have data now on uh, 11 countries collected you know, this uh, uh, high frequency, even monthly. Um, and so it's so, it's so possible now to collect information. And what is new and original about this data set is we can combine financial literacy data with perception, expectations, and behavior. This is information we didn't have before, and I think we can learn and I've certainly learned uh, a great deal by looking at this uh, new data. Um, first of all, I want to show you that when we look at the big three, we find the same result that has been reported in other studies as well, just to confirm, unfortunately, the same findings, uh, heterogeneity in financial literacy and also low level of financial literacy across many countries, unfortunately, a gender difference in financial literacy, and the people who have the low financial literacy are the same, as I've said before, and strikingly so across countries. They are disproportionately the young and potentially also the, lower popu the older population. We see this inverted U shape when we look across age and court. And those with lower education and lower income are also those that often are disproportionately low financial literacy. But here, we have a set of questions that I think can shed more light on these type of behaviors that can be important for the central banks. So just by, I want to divide in these four categories and let's look at how financial literacy can affect, for example, the saving that people are making, the decision I'm talking about uh, for saving and investing. And the first thing I wanted to show you is that when it comes to the willingness willingness to take risk, 
we find that the people with low financial literacy tell us they are not willing to take any risks. Um, and unfortunately, I think this has to do with, of course, their comprehension of risk. You know, risk is something available, uh, and something so present in our life, you know, that what we probably have to do is to manage risk rather than, um, you know, not take any risk. And you can see there is a very wide difference between these two groups of low and high financial literacy. And I remind you that to, to be high financial literacy here just means to be able to answer the big three. So it's just the ABC of uh, personal finance knowledge. Similarly, when we look at the planning horizon, something that should worry us is that Many people in disproportionately the low financial literacy as as planning horizon for the saving and investing for the future less than three months. It's very hard to invest in the stock market if uh, your planning horizon is less than three months. And uh, this is uh, one of the my favorite uh, finding and graphs uh, here in the in this data. When we ask people, and again, I want to look at the financial decision making, and these are hypothetical questions, so we try to also abstract from their current financial situation, we say, well, when is it a good time to save and to borrow? And if we look at, for example, the behavioral interest rate in the economy, as you can see here, when interest rate go up, um, high financial literacy people uh, understand that this is a good time to save, um, less so, for example, with the low financial literacy, which are much less sensitive to the interest rate. And strikingly, when the interest rate go up, um, the high financial literacy understand that, you know, the borrowing becomes more expensive, much less so for the low financial literacy people, uh, that are potentially a lot also more likely to have debt. Um, does it matter? Uh, it does matter. And I wanted to show in this regression, this very simple regression, that financial literacy is indeed linked to investing, um, investing directly in stock and mutual funds. And also I'd like to attract your attention here that in Europe disproportionately, you know, there are a relatively low level of participation in the stock market and also a relatively low level of uh, um, uh, having products for um, private, uh, private um, uh, retirement uh, uh, pension product. Uh, you know, I'm talking about products similar to the IRA in, in the United States. And again, as we think of the aging of the population, as we think of the importance of people saving for their future, growing and accumulating wealth, in particular, you know, in an environment um, like the, the past where inflation was higher or thinking of the aging of the population, we should be worried potentially of this low participation in the financial market, this low capacity potentially to grow their wealth and also to save for the future, to save for retirement, and financial literacy does play a role. Let me uh, turn now to debt and debt management. Um, and what we find here as well when we ask, but do you shop around? For, um, for making borrowing uh, decision uh, and for obtaining credit to get the best term. You'll see as well, yet again, the low financial literacy are doing a less uh, shopping around. And again, probably for them, uh, this potentially lower cost can be even more important and beneficial. Um, when we... Uh, and this is another of, uh, I think, a, a favorite uh, graph and really striking. When we ask people about taking a mortgage uh, to purchase a house and an apartment today, what would be the, uh, the type of mortgage they choose, whether a fixed um, or a adjustable rate mortgage, depending on the interest rate, we see again what I think is a, a striking uh, result, which is that the high financial literacy understand that if the interest rates are low, uh, it's a good time potentially to have a fixed rate uh, mortgage. But when the interest rate go up, 
you know, it's much less so. Um, and unfortunately for the low financial literacy, there is a very little sensitivity to the interest rate. You know, even when the interest rate go up, people uh, choose the fixed rate mortgages. And we were so struck by this result that we also ran a regression to see whether this is statistically significant in the data, and it is so. Um, and when we look at the attention of the interest rate, um, we see that, uh, for example, uh, people with low financial literacy pay a lot less attention to the interest rate in the country they live in, even if they have an adjustable rate mortgage. So unfortunately, low financial literacy is also connected with low attention, less search, less potential ability to choose the best product that are available for you so you can pay less interest and you can potentially choose a product that is best for your financial circumstances. Does it matter? Again, if we look at the measure of um, potentially having problem with that, for example, being late in making payments, we see that the people with the um, low financial literacy are a lot more likely to be late in their debt and to potentially have problem with that, which is also consistent with other uh, data set, including the personal finance index. Now, let me turn again to financial fragility. Um, the question in the survey is very similar to the question we have asked. So here we don't ask about the $2,000, but uh, about having uh, an expected expense equal to about of a month of uh, uh, income. Would you be able to have sufficient resources to pay for this amount? And I wanted to show you that the same result we found in other data set, like the personal finance index, even in recent data, is confirmed here. People uh, we have, who have uh, low financial uh, knowledge are, less, uh, are uh, more likely to be financially fragile. And interestingly, when we ask, what is the amount that you need to put aside that you need to have for, for unexpected expenses, we see yet again this very, very low amount. And in fact, many people indicate zero savings uh, to deal with unexpected shocks. Potentially not being aware that it's important to have this uh, sort of insurance uh, uh, when it comes to, to shocks and that it, you know, other methods might provide liquidity, but they not, might not provide insurance. And that's to try to put some light on why do we get this finding? What are the decision making or what are the thinking behind this type of um, results? And again, this is why we want to look with a personal finance lens and understand that when you have that very basic level of knowledge, potentially there is the decision you come to are you know, decisions that are potentially less likely to make you financially secure and less likely to make you be able to face a shock. Let me turn now to uh, something that uh, uh, is very important and we have also faced in our own um, uh, policy, for example, in dealing uh, in Italy with the um, Financial Education Committee. When you are facing uh, so many, uh, such a large group of the population which has low financial literacy, how do you convey the policy? How do people understand what you do? And how do you communicate so that you are understood? If people don't know what inflation is or, don't, or cannot do a 2% calculation, how are you able to be effective in that communication? And I have to say, it's certainly a challenge. Um, if we look at another definition of inflation, so if we don't ask the big three, but if we ask people to define what inflation is, you can see yet again that indeed the low financial literacy do not know about inflation or know less um, about inflation, let's say, than the high financial literacy, to be precise. When we ask about the objective of the ECB, and we ask actually about seven questions here, uh, going from is uh, is the central bank responsible for tax policies in Europe? Is the central bank responsible for making policy decisions for the budgets in in countries and so on? 
we see that indeed the high financial literacy know more about the ECB policy and what the ECB does than the low financial literacy. And as you can see here, there is actually a high proportion of people who cannot answer any of the seven questions correctly. Now, not only um, this happens, but uh, people are with higher financial literacy. And again, higher financial literacy means just the knowledge of this ABC of personal finance are a lot better able to understand also the effectiveness of central bank policies. For example, that uh, you know, the ECB policy decision to raise the interest rate to ensure, uh, to ensure the price stability is better understood by the uh, high financial literacy people. And let me actually turn to what I think is a worrisome finding, which is that not just the high financial literacy are a lot more supportive of the euro, but you see here almost a, a divergence between the low financial literacy and the high financial literacy group when we ask uh, how likely do you think that the central bank will maintain price stability in the euro economy over the next three years as the interest rate in a sense go up to achieve that price stability in fact, the low financial literacy think that the ECB is less likely to achieve the price stability. So there are important implications for central banks and central banks' policies when the financial literacy is so low in the population because people are also not able to grasp or understand or fully comprehend and appreciate uh, what the central banks are doing to promote price stability, are doing for their citizens, are doing to improve the financial well-being of their citizen. And we see that even information about the ECB, remember one of the, for example, topic I cover in the personal finance index is where people do, where do people get information? Unfortunately, in almost in every country, the people with low financial literacy get information from very uninformal sources, you know, family and friends, uh, uh, colleagues, and so on. But sometimes family and friends know as little as you do. And what we see here as well is that the low financial literacy do not get the information, of, for example, about um, the European Central Bank from sources like newspaper or the TV or the website or the social media, and in fact, they are disproportionately more likely to get no information. So uh, what have we learned here? Uh, unfortunately, that the findings about the low financial literacy are still confirmed, and, and that's why it's important that we step up the effort to improve financial literacy, because it is still critically low and on a large part of the population. And this also raises the questions that if there is such a large part of the population that doesn't have even this basic knowledge, how do we communicate the policy that we do? Um, and also, I want to uh, push us to think of the fact that, you know, this low financial literacy is not the same across uh, demographic groups. And there are groups that we can target. And certainly as academic, we can target the young. Um, but also I want to talk potentially of other policy that can be done so that we can make some progress in improving the financial literacy because it has important implication for financial well-being. And I hope I have at least tried to convince you that when we look at the financial decision making, there is probably not strong reason to believe that people are making informed decisions. Often they don't get the information and often they don't use this information to compare terms, you know, to potentially choose the lower cost financial instrument and, and also uh, invest in the financial markets and try to also ensure the long-term uh, financial security. So I want to, in these few minutes, uh, talk about what also uh, we can do, for example, as researcher, and I would like to talk also some of the initiative that we have been doing here at Stanford uh, relating to, for example, teaching uh, financial literacy to our students. Um, we have started a course a few years ago, and it has become one of the most popular course uh, in the economics department. 
when the personal finance course for, first started here at Stanford. Uh, 360 students uh, uh, sign up. This is uh, one of the largest econ course. In fact, it's one of the large, largest course uh, among the, uh, the university, apart from computer science. We are now almost teaching personal finance. We aim to teach personal finance each term. Um, and we have a financial literacy seminar series, an annual conference. So we are trying to make financial literacy and personal finance a regular course for the student here. And, and we just last Friday held a conference bringing together everybody who is teaching personal finance in the US from the Ivy League to community colleges to try to share experiences and, and also try to make sure that this course is now becoming a common part of, a, for example, a economics department curriculum or a course that the student in every university can uh, access. And, and this is very much uh, consistent with the initiative for financial decision making that we are launching here at Stanford officially last week as well. And this is why I want to mention it. It's a joint project between the Business School, the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and the Department of Economics, where we want to bring the data and, and the research that we have done so that we can um, have a more rigorous course and we can do teaching, but we can use technology to also bring this personal finance to a lot more than the young and and also we can expand this education uh, across the US and across other countries as well, and also uh, involve policy um, so that we can all try to do our share in try to promote and increase uh, personal finance knowledge. I also want to turn for a moment um, to a, uh, this gender difference in financial literacy and tell you very briefly about a study that we did, by the way, using the Dutch central bank data. And this is a yet again to show just how central bank have been able to help researcher in um, understanding more about per, uh, financial literacy and what we can do. When we look at the gender difference in financial literacy, a lot of this difference doesn't come from the fact that women answer incorrectly the question about, uh, uh, about financial literacy, but they disproportionately answer, I do not know. So in this uh, project that we did with the Dutch Central Bank, we asked the big three in a traditional way, and then we took away the do not know option. And in a sense, we forced everybody to give an answer. And we found what you are probably also expecting, which is that when pushed to answer this question, actually women do know the answer um, and they seem to be a knowledge, they are more knowledgeable than they think they are, but unfortunately they are less confident. So in other words, they are not confident about their knowledge. And so what we are able to show is that not just are women uh, less financially literate, but they are less uh, confident in their knowledge. And we could even, in a sense, uh, um, pin down how much of that gender difference is due to confidence versus knowledge. And what I can say is about one third, according to the Dutch data of the gender gap in financial literacy is due to confidence which also give us some suggestion for how we do, for example, teaching and, and personal finance program. I very much changed the way I teach my course, for example, to take advantage um, of this knowledge. And unfortunately, both knowledge and confidence are responsible for this lack of participation in the stock market of women. So there is a lot we can do, for example, about targeting and doing program for women um, inspired by the data. And, and the reason to target this group, it's a very large group, and we have found it has spillover effect. If you educate women, it has spillover effect on children, the adult, and their community. But let me conclude, just to uh, repeat in a sense what I started with, which is that low financial literacy, unfortunately consumer, and there are many of those, are less likely to use financial instrument in a way that can help their personal finances. And this has consequences, not just for them, but also potentially for the macroeconomy. 
And this is why I would like to recommend, as we have done in many surveys, to add financial literacy to the national statistics. So to also show that we need to look as well at this indicator as a, as, as a proxy for the state of the economy and also to give a signal that we do care about how much people know because it has implication for the economy and it has implication for the well-being of an economy. And uh, for uh, central banks, I think it's very important to promote financial literacy because it is linked to investing behavior and saving to debt management to be able to cope, to the ability to cope with shocks and also, and uh, importantly, about how people understand the objective and the policy of the central banks. So um, if we want to gain the trust of people, it's very important that this communication is done properly, but it's also important that we raise the level of financial literacy so we can, many more people can better make these decisions that are just so important for the well being. And I know um, I've given you a lot of number, I've given you a lot of data, but I'd like to leave you with this message or this image of what is financial literacy and the way I would like to characterize and the image I would like to leave um, uh, today is that, in my view, financial literacy is like water in an ecosystem. You know, the ecosystem is composed of many parts and you can, for example, interact and intervene in many parts, but people need, the ecosystem need water to be able to grow and flourish. Thank you very much. And if you like to kind of read about this work, it is summarized in a paper that we have published uh, last year in the Journal of Economic Perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anna Maria, for uh, a really fascinating uh, presentation. I think you you convinced us that uh, financial literacy is a first order topic I mean, for society and also for central banks. And uh, therefore, also thank you very much for all the initiatives that you are leading in this area. I think this is this is really hugely uh, important. So fortunately, we have some time for questions, and therefore I would like to uh, open uh, the floor. So please, there's a mic coming. Um, so this is Johannes from the Bundesbank. Um, I'm wondering, um, so it seems like uh, nowadays uh, bad decisions are not only taken in finance, but also in the political sphere quite often. So. Uh, I'm wondering whether you have uh, thought of applying your expertise in that field as well. And um, maybe a related question. So what I take away from your talk is that, um, so what can we do against this, right? And I was thinking about it. I mean, it's conceptually very simple, right? These kind of calculations. I guess a 10-year-old could do that. But is it maybe an implication that, for instance, in, in the schools, they should teach more of this practical stuff? So tell people what inflation rates are and so on, uh, what risk is, and you know, maybe similar things in the political sphere. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much for these questions. And uh, very much so, I'd like to say, you know, there are implications for, I think, our democracies. In other words, you know, we ask people to make decisions about uh, policies like, you know, uh, budget deficit, and we um, politicians are making a lot of promises. I'm thinking, for example, about pension reforms and so on. So, do people truly appreciate um, these policies or these promises? Um, and I think, you know. In many ways, I think one of the reasons why um, we should also improve financial literacy is that people can make better decisions in policies, um, or at least inform decision and better understand what are the implications of those policies. Many of these policies, by the way, have implication for the long term. Um, and so, again, if people are, you know, if their planning horizon is three months, uh, it's certainly very difficult uh, to make those um, potentially informed decisions. 
I have not done um, research in this area, but for example, I want to refer you to work that both Elsa Fornero and Anna Loprete in Italy, uh, for example, have done. And, uh, and I have a, a special potentially um, preference for them uh, and for that work, because for example, Elsa Fornero, in addition to being a, a top economist, uh, has also been one of our uh, minister uh, and one of the ministers that implemented a very, um, uh, a, a, a very innovative, I would say, uh, uh, pension reform in Italy, and uh, she had paid the consequences uh, very harshly of having done that uh, that courageous act. Um, I also want to mention what should we be doing. Um, uh, I think we should very much introduce uh, personal finance and financial literacy in school, and certainly not just at the college level, but as soon as possible, for example, at the elementary school. And I don't think we should teach that practical stuff, uh, as you have called it, but I think we should teach that basic knowledge so that people are able to make decisions. You know, we don't teach in personal finance how to balance a checkbook that belongs in the history course. Uh, but we uh, actually teach people how to make financial decisions. And uh, I always say financial literacy today is as important as reading and writing. You know, this society has become so complex in its own financial markets, right, that we need people to have this basic knowledge, otherwise you are not able to participate to the economy. Thank you very much. So who wants to ask the next question? Please. Thank you, Yuri Gorodnichenko, UC Berkeley. One question I have for you is, uh, do you have a sense that uh, low financial literacy can propagate from one generation to another? If parents are not financially literate, then the children are not going to be financially literate, and then we can have some type of poverty traps. That's my first question. And my second question is, um, as, as, as a professor, I know there is always a distribution of grades in any class, no matter how hard you try. And uh, one question then for you is, what is the realistic upper bound we can have on financial literacy? Is this like everybody is going to be an A student or everybody is going to have a B average? Uh, what we can achieve with better education? Thank you so much for these great questions. So first of all, you are absolutely right. And one of the reasons why um, I think we should have financial literacy in the schools, and I'm going to push this even further and to say we need to make it mandatory, is because when we look at this very small group of people who are financially literate, are disproportionately white males from college-educated families in the US, and this is true in other countries as well. Actually, we have a paper that very few people cite and is actually one of my favorite paper. When we look at data from the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, and we look at people, millennials, which are 23 to 28, and because this is a long panel, we can link the financial literacy to the knowledge and actually, or and, and to also financial circumstances of these young people when they were growing up. So when there were 12 to 17. And what we can do, we can link the financial literacy of people 23 to 28 to the stocks and retirement savings of their families when they were teenagers. In other words, people are learning financial literacy at the dinner table, but only if, of course, parents are, have high education and if parents have invested in the stock market of have retirement savings, right? So you, we see, I think, this uh, very strong correlation between your economic background and your level of financial literacy. In other words, you know, some people are exposed indeed to this knowledge, but this is a very, you know, group, which is unfortunately the, the group, which is already, you know, high income and, and high wealth, and for the others, there is very little opportunity potentially to learn. And maybe what you learn is only how to, you know, go to the payday lender or, or so on, right? If you are looking at, the, uh, at your family. And overall, I have to say, if we think that parents are going to be our teachers, 
Well, unfortunately, many parents in the U.S., for example, didn't have student loans, right? Didn't have the type of pension we have now, didn't have cryptos or by now pay laters. You know, it depends on whether you think it's good or not, but it's very hard sometimes to even learn from the experience of the parents. So which grade are we aiming to? Uh, I'm not aiming for an A plus uh, to everybody in the population, but the reason why I wanted to show the big three is that, you know, this really is financial illiteracy, right? People do not know the basics. So we need to at least raise the basics. We need everybody to have, you know, that minimum knowledge and our research shows, you know, you don't need to be financially sophisticated. You don't need to know the black shawl formulas to be able to make financial decision. But if you don't have the ABC, so in other words, if you are financially illiterate, you know, if you are not able to read and write, you are not going to be able to participate to society. Today, if you don't have that basic knowledge, you are also not to be able to make good decision. So let's raise at least that basic knowledge and go to a B minus. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Stefano Ramelli, University of St. Gallen. Thank you very much for your, for your talk. I wanted to ask you, what are the roots of financial, financial illiteracy in your opinion? It's just a matter of education or lack of education, or there is something more profound that is more cultural, an antipathy toward finance that prevents some people to, uh, to acquire these basic skills? Thank you. Thank you so much, what a great question. Um, so first of all, I actually think that the reason why we are illiterate is because the world has changed very fast and we are not keeping up. Right? And this is, I think, what has exactly happened in education, you know, a hundred years or so ago. You know, we didn't require people to be able to read and write, right, to do certain jobs. I actually just, I was in Italy in uh, September, and I saw this documentary that actually shows that, you know, people that were sweeping the streets uh, 100 years ago, and in, in a town very close to my hometown, Fidenza, um, they actually impose to the people just cleaning the street, you know, the most basic job, to have at least an elementary education. And they discovered that many people didn't have an elementary education. And, and so that imposition made, you know, people to have at least that basic knowledge and that had spillover uh, then also on their children. Right. So I see the same now happening in, you know, like financial market have become a lot more complex. You know, the decision, the responsibility to make some of these decisions, think of pensions, um, think of uh, health care and so on, has been shifting upon us. And so we need this knowledge. But is it enough to explain the difference we see in financial literacy, for example, across countries? I think culture plays a role. And one of the things, uh, um, you know, we have seen, for example, if you look at the PISA data, and if you look at the 15 years old, we have asked people how interested they are in making, you know, in talking about money, for example, or in uh, financial issues. And very interestingly, there is a big difference uh, in financial literacy across country. And in our own Italy, we are an outlier in terms of 15 years old of how people are interested in financial literacy or in, in talking about money, while in Europe, more or less about only 50%, you know, about 50% of the young are interested in talking about money matter. In Italy, only 36% are, right? So I think, you know, uh, one of the mission of the uh, initiative here and our mission, we would like to describe it, is change the conversation about money in the US. Right. If you think of religion, if you think of other reason, you know, we think that money is taboo, right? We think that we shouldn't talk about this. And I think it's time uh, to change that because uh, finance is um, enable us in a sense to achieve important result. And we need to have that conversation. Thank you very much. Any further comments? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Olga Goldfein Frank from uh, from German Central Bank. Um, I have such particular 
one comment and one question. So apart from uh, European Central Bank and European data, the Austrian Central Bank have been surveying um, Eastern European companies, uh, countries, and in particular asking there about financial literacy. And there is one uh, long documented but not very well known phenomenon, and namely that Eastern European countries are some of the very few exceptions where there is no gender gap in financial literacy. And um, one tries to, to build a hypothesis why it is so, and uh, the distinguishing traits of this country is that universal education, the same curriculum for boys and girls, including math, and you cannot choose not to do that, and universal labor force participation. So all women, all men had to work up to a certain age and so on and so forth. So I want to ask you, what do you think of the three factors would matter most in your intuition? Is it education, numeracy basically, right? Is it uh, participation in active labor life or is it a role model? Because one can assume that men see so boys see their fathers work and talk to their fathers and girls see their mothers and talk to their mothers but there is no gap between fathers and mothers there is no gender gap as a result thank you thank you this is another great question and you are absolutely right by the way and, and if you look for example at germany um and so we had a paper um um in the journal of uh, pension uh, and um uh, and finance um, in 2011, looking at the east-west difference, and, and even in Germany now, in the eastern uh, people who are living in what was considered East Germany, uh, we don't see a gender difference in financial literacy. Unfortunately, it's also due to the fact that you know they also men do not know much, right? So it's not necessarily a good result. In other words, both for the men and for the women, the financial literacy is low. But you talk about a topic that I don't think we have been able to fully explain. So we can explain some of this gender difference in financial literacy, but not all. Um, and, and so, you know, I agree with you that this, some of these three um, explanations that you have put forward are important. And we have done a study, for example, looking at the PISA data, which cover financial literacy among 15 years old. And we find that indeed the role model, and um, this is in particular data about Italy, where we see a gender difference in financial literacy forming even at age 15. So the role um, of the mother, whether the mother works in finance is important. Uh, the role of education is important. Countries, for example, that have financial literacy in the school uh, might be better able uh, to have you know, a much more uniform financial literacy. Participation in the labor market is important as well, yet we are not fully able to explain that gender difference. And so if there is a topic I want to leave for research, it's exactly that. Um, and I also think it's a very important topic. Again, women are a very large part of the population. So closing this gender gap, improving the financial literacy of women uh, can have important implication for for the families, for themselves, but also for the economy. And I invite all of you researchers to potentially use uh, the data and, and try to, um, to see what we can do to better understand this gender gap. So I'm, uh, um, I'm sorry to say that we have to come uh, to the end of, of this really uh, inspiring session. So thank you uh, very much again. Uh, for giving uh, this interesting uh, talk. So you, uh, you convinced me at least that uh, it's much better to uh, in, invest in uh, financial education than, for example, to have all this consumer protection, which is often happening now, right? If in Germany you want to buy stocks, you first you get, you know, you get many forms where you have to, uh, to say that you understand everything. Of course, maybe you haven't even read it. So all of these things, I think, don't work, and financial education is the way uh, to go. I mean, for us as central banks, uh, you showed very convincingly how relevant um, uh, this is. I, I thought this one uh, chart was uh, was quite striking on the um, uh, credibility of the uh, of the ECB, where you compared uh, the the uh, low and high financial literacy uh, people, and you could you could see that 
uh, basically uh, with, the, with the rising prices, the low financial literacy people lost trust, whereas the others understood that we were doing a lot in order to get inflation uh, back to target. And of course, that matters for uh, what we do. It matters for monetary policy transmission. If half of the people don't understand what we are doing, I mean, the best case, 50% is noise, but it could even be that 50% is going in the wrong direction, so it really weakens then our monetary policy transmission. So uh, many, many very relevant uh, issues that you touched upon. I also saw that in your charts, at least, um, financial literacy seems to be relatively stable over time, so it's probably not easy to, to change this. So it's a big task, and we are very happy uh, that you are um, uh, contributing to uh, changing this. Uh, we as central banks also try uh, to do our part. But thank you very much uh, for being with us. It was really uh, a great pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And so this uh, concludes the first day of our conference. Uh, I hope uh, you all enjoyed uh, the, the first day. And the good news is that there's going to be a second day tomorrow. Uh, and uh, so we are, of course, all looking forward to another round of interesting presentations. But uh, thanks for your participation uh, today, and have a very nice evening. <laughs>